estamos a falar do homem e da máquina. Uh, uh, a corrida entre o homem e, o, e a máquina. Será mesmo uma corrida? Será isto uma questão de ver quem chega primeiro mais depressa, uh, com mais energia uh, uh, ao fim? Ou será uma luta? Ou será uh, para ver quem ganha a quem? Ou será um mundo de paradoxos, de incertezas, de sonhos e pesadelos, como afinal sempre foi a evolução da humanidade? Homem e máquina, esta dialética empurra-nos para um mundo de confronto, de tensão, uma coisa de um lado, outra coisa do outro. Que mundo é que queremos amanhã? É, é um pouco aquilo que nós estamos aqui a perguntar, de uma forma muito indireta, sob várias uh, formas. Queremos um mundo automatizado, mas feliz? Queremos um mundo uh, um, uh, automatizado, muito melhor? Mas temos muitos dúvidas, muitas dúvidas que isso consiga ser mais perfeito, mais equilibrado, que alguma vez conseguimos até agora. O que, o que é que queremos verdadeiramente que aconteça? Porque, na verdade, é o ser humano que está a desenhar e a construir as máquinas que, ao mesmo tempo, nos atemorizam. E, portanto, isto é um pouco estranho, uh, na verdade. Ou então, como em tudo, será que nós conseguimos estabelecer o equilíbrio? Onde é que será exatamente na escala esse equilíbrio? Uh, acima, abaixo, à esquerda, à direita, um, leste, oeste? Um, vamos começar por falar do homem. O homem. Na sessão da tarde, aqui no palco principal, uh, a pergunta era se a arte será o último reduto da humanidade. E vimos aqui que havia logo uh, uma dificuldade muito grande em encontrar consensos sobre o que é que significa a arte e a humanidade. O humanismo, neste caso. Bom, no more uh, shit talk. Uh, eu peço que a pessoa que vai entrar em palco a seguir é uma pessoa que vive das palavras, respira as palavras, Uh, uh, e trabalha com as palavras. De resto, as, trabalha, uh, as palavras são o trabalho da sua vida. Eu não sei muito bem como traduzir aquilo que ele faz. Espero que todos tenham visto os vídeos no YouTube. Um, foi o que eu fiz. Mas ainda assim vou tentar perguntar para ver se ele consegue explicar por palavras o que é isso de ser uh, uh, um mestre, um campeão, um guru, uma referência de slam poetry. Não consigo traduzir. Uh, ou não quero. Um, ele uh, exige, e muito bem, que o tratemos pelo nome porque é conhecido. É o InQ. Eu peço numa salva de palmas. InQ, you're welcome on stage. Awesome. I was saying in Portuguese. Yeah. You, you can say something, of course. Sorry. How are you? <laughs> Can I have some more energy? Do you guys feel good? Do you feel alive? Yeah. All right. Quite alive. <laughs> you work in a world of words. What do they mean to you, words? Well, it's interesting. I wish that I could communicate in uh, Portuguese. I only know English, but words in general I mean, imagine what the world would be without words. Nothing would really exist. We wouldn't have cooperation the way that we do. We wouldn't have cities the way that we do. Words are really the structure of us growing as humanity because it's ways that we tell our stories. So I'm very careful how I tell my story for myself and for my audience because words matter. Uh, and it's not a problem if you don't speak Portuguese, you know, at all. Um, uh, one of the most famous Portuguese poets, and I think that most of us around here, uh, even if we don't know each other, uh, we, we share a common um, wow and love and uh, passion about most of his books. His name is Fernando Pessoa. Pessoa means person in English, so it's quite interesting also, but he wrote in English. And in one of his books, in Portuguese, he said something that I'm going to tell you. It's just a small phrase. Uh, I, I, I love the small phrases he, he got about all the, the meaning of everything around him. Uh, I don't write in Portuguese. I write myself. Mm, it's beautiful. So um, I think you should 
take a look at uh, so uh, this is the only book I had at home um, uh, with some uh, expressions uh, translated in English or written originally in English because they do it uh, and so keep it I love this thank you uh, I appreciate it and uh, in Q, you're a genius of poetry slam. Thank you. How can you tell, how can you explain to a four-year-old child what is that? Uh, poetry is looking around, figuring out what you're inspired by, what you're moved by in your life, and starting with something that's true. And if I start with something that's true, and I give the poem time and space, the poem will almost write itself. So Poetry Slam is about taking inspiration or taking something that you're moved by or even taking something that you're in pain from and using that to create something with it. So it's the process of alchemy. Improvising. Uh, I definitely improvise, but I don't improvise when I'm doing my poems because they're too important to me. Every word is too important. And what I want to express, I don't leave to the moment. Okay, so at this very moment, do you already know what we are going to hear from you? Like 80%. Okay. Um, so, that, that's just one more thing before um, I, I leave the stage role for you. But uh, I read an interview with you uh, last weekend in a weekly Portuguese newspaper. And uh, it, you, you answered something and, and you told something very uh, deep. Um, uh, you said, there's poetry everywhere. I can feel it even in my bones. How can you explain that to, uh, I don't know, imagine that uh, there's two people in, in the audience that didn't understand what you were willing to say. I think it's probably better that I show them rather than tell them. Okay, so. But do you guys feel the poetry in your bones? Just one young lady right over here. Incredible. Two. Lots of love. <laughs> So I'll leave you just with one more uh, uh, phrase, yes. sentence from Pessoa. Uh, in, in Portuguese, it's a, a construction quite uh, strange, but it says something like this. I feel pain mm. in my head and in the universe. Mm. It's beautiful. Okay. In Q. It's beautiful because we are the universe. We're yes. made out of the same substance. You know, and within this realm, we have these separations. But in reality, it's just a sea of consciousness. We're all just vibrating energy. So the pain that he feels in his head is the pain that he feels in the universe and vice versa. That's it. Yeah. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I just want to get some more energy. So first and foremost, um, I would like everybody to take a big collective deep breath. Ready? Let it out. We're going to do one more. And this time, we're going to make noise when we let it out. Ready? Go. Ah. Thank you. Growing up is about learning and then unlearning everything that we have learned. It's about constructing and then deconstructing who we are at every turn. Disrupting being in the flow to contemplate the tide. And then letting go again to take the ride without your mind. We fight to get ahead, but we always leave someone behind. And I'm scared to lose it all for something I'm not sure I'll find. But faith is always blind. The only thing that's guaranteed is we're all born to die. So if you have a voice, use it or it withers over time. 
where forgotten dreams are buried in the corners of our minds, and a life without a dream is not a life, it's killing time. And since time is killing us, it's only right we compromise. We are here to change the world. So it's selfish not to try to pacify yourself as your life passes you by to be a passenger when you're the one that asked if you could drive. Otherwise, you wouldn't be alive. Everybody put one hand in the sky like this. Everybody do it. Snap it out. Have you ever been excited for now? Okay, this is some interactive shit. You have to respond to me. <laughs> have you ever been excited for now? Yeah. Well, how about? Yeah. Okay, if not, just look around. Everybody look around. Make some eye contact with the people around you. You're sitting on the ground, but you're sitting upside down. The world is really round. And gravity is not the only thing that holds you down. See, light is faster than the speed of sound, and outer space doesn't make a sound. Our inner space can be way more profound. I could say more, but how? I'd be better off attempting to express it through a howl. How? Everybody do that. Ready? One, two, three. Everything is beautiful, even when it's ugly. I know that seems unusual to almost everybody, so it's lucky you're not everybody. What's your name? Yes, you. Anna? Everybody say, hi, Anna. Anna, it's lucky you're not everybody. You're somebody and the sum of anybody in a prehistoric body. So jump without the net and I promise you'll remember that you came here to forget. And yet, it's hard for me to say yes. Everybody say yes. Yeah. Say it like you mean it. Say yes. It's hard for me to say yes. I mean, it's easier to say next year. When the weather's fine. When I have the money or the time or the relationship I want or the career or the house or the car or the watch. Watch, life pass me by waiting for an invitation when the world is greater than my nation or my occupation. The only thing I know is that we're all in this together. And the future of this earth depends on how we treat each other. But how we treat each other starts with how we treat ourselves. And how we treat ourselves starts with how we see ourselves. And how we see ourselves starts with context. Nothing can exist without its opposite. Remember this, the next time you find you're in an argument and both sides are talking shit and you forget your point except you're angry now and want to win, so you continue yelling till they give it up by giving in so you can stand victorious because you're right on what again? Do we laugh on instinct or do we choose to laugh? Do we ask because we care or do we merely ask? I ask you this because I care about how humans act. We're animals aware of our future and our past and this can be an obstacle to traveling our path. Instead of just accepting where we're at, we analyze our tracks for what we could have had. Looking back, focused on the memories instead of on the facts, hence what we attract. But it's hard to factor in how fast it really flashes past. It's an exponential graph from creation into ash. 
I'm sentimental one minute. Then I'm making plans. Staking claims. Shaking hands. Breaking out or breaking in. I have about a billion mimes hidden underneath my skin. And they pull my face into this grin or they push my wrinkled forehead in. So pour the sin and philosophize because no one has your awesome eyes. Your view is worth the lows and highs that you will go through on this roller coaster ride. Control has got us holding on when letting go could be more fun. Hands up. Everybody put your freaking hands up. Okay, just kind of wave them around for a bit. Okay, now start to hit yourself. Start to pound on your chest. Harder. All right, do it to the one person on one side of you. Do it to the person on the other side of you. Put your hands back up. Now let them drop. Eventually this life is going to stop. It's going to level out, then come back up until you reach the very top. Because one day, all your wheels fall off. So take advantage of your shocks. Do something you've never done. Do someone you've never done. That works better in a bar. Go someplace you've never gone. Someplace that will scare you some. Be someone you've never been. You feel all that adrenaline? It's medicine to jumpstart the spark inside your skeleton. See, everywhere you are is where you're supposed to be. So hopefully, you're hopelessly as lost as me. Because if you're not, you ought to be. So you might be thinking, why did they bring a poet to talk about the future of technology? And I don't think that it's my job to talk about the future of technology. I think that it's my job to ask questions about what our humanity is. And that's why they brought me, to have a moment of being human together. So I want to tell you a true story. I was coming out of my new therapist's office the other day and sitting in the waiting room was my old therapist. That's 100% true. And I thought, we are all going through this human thing together. My old therapist had an appointment with my new therapist. My new therapist and I were discussing the differences between ideas and ideologies. And he was saying that ideas are tools that you can use in your life that will change as your truth and your experience changes. But he said ideologies are different because ideologies are things that you have to force everything in your reality into the frame of. Otherwise, you will lose control over that ideology and that part of your life. So I started thinking about it, and I realized I use way too many ideologies, whether they were handed down to me or whether I created them myself. So I was walking down the street, and I thought, you know, from now on, I only want to use ideas. So I decided to say it out loud, because I'm a believer that if you want something to come true, you have to declare it. So I said it out loud. I was like, from now on, I'm only going to use ideas. And then I said it again louder, like to the universe. I was like, from now on, I'm only going to use ideas. And then I was like, 
ah, I just created a new ideology. I want to buy a house where I can make memories in every room. Plant a garden in my backyard and watch the flowers bloom. It will be big, but not so big that one would get lost. It will be nice, but not so nice that everybody whispers, what it costs? It will have gorgeous views, but being higher doesn't mean superior. I've learned not to judge a house by what's on the exterior. It's what's on the interior. And I don't mean design because a house is not a home unless the people are aligned. I used to want a mansion because I thought that would bring me joy. I went and bought a lot of stuff that I had no time to enjoy. I was working for a living, but it wasn't working because I wasn't living. And a life without living is unfulfilling, filling up the empty space with all the things that I was getting, yet I could never get enough or give enough to be enough. And that was constantly upsetting. Value is a funny thing. Is it something that we own? Or is it something that we bring? Experiences are priceless. And that doesn't cost a thing. Because once you make your minds up, you can accomplish anything. Even if it seemed impossible. Impossible is possible. We take for granted that defying gravity is illogical. Intend what you desire and your will will be unstoppable. You guys with me? So you could buy an island with a climate that is tropical or fly a helicopter off the coast of the Galapagos while eating avocado toast. All right, that was a joke. But even if I was flat broke, I wouldn't rely on hope because hope can be despair in disguise. So instead, I decide, then I watch as my reality realigns. After all, what is time if it's different in a different place? We're all in one place, floating out in outer space. They'll never bottle time. You can't buy any more. And if you could, it'd be sold out at every corner store. So lately, I've been thinking, what if less is really more? If my mortality is what I'm really living for? I want to slide in socks across Italian marble floor. I want imported art to fill up every corridor. I want my kids to use my bed like it's their trampoline, to walk on top of my couch like it's their balance beam. I want to use my things so they aren't using me. After all, the most important things in life are free. I did a show once, and this woman was like, me. I was like, you don't understand the poem, do you? We only borrow land. We only borrow time. We only borrow love. But you can borrow mine. Mi casa, su casa, stay over any time. If you're a friend, you'll have a permanent vacancy sign. Community is what our culture is lacking. We pretend that we're connected, but mostly it's just unscripted acting. 
We isolate ourselves and hide from our emotions, then pack our schedules as an excuse to stay in motion. I'm living by the beach, and yet I never see the ocean because it's always out of reach in the midst of my commotion. God forbid I'd have to sit alone without distraction. It's hard to notice thoughts if you're constantly in action. No matter what your status is, that isn't satisfaction. So I don't only care what you do. I care that you're doing life with passion. If you feel alive, say yeah. Yeah. That's why we all should share our gifts and cultivate compassion. Because the fastest way to bliss is through a meaningful interaction. And since I'm not even sure that we exist, I've started asking if this world of form is merely the illusion of attachment. If I could let it all go, my roof would be the stars. My floor would be the earth. My doors would be a jar. My walls would be the wind. My seat would be a stone. My bed would be the clouds and my heart would be my home. But since I have a family and I don't live my life alone, I went and bought a house where I could make memories in every room. So uh, I'm just going to do one more piece, but it's a real privilege to be here with you guys tonight. I've never been to Portugal before. You're a wonderful, wonderful audience, and this event is absolutely incredible. So everybody, please give it up for the organizers. I used to uh, live in this tiny little uh, back home, and the woman who owned the main home her mom moved in at a certain point, and she was in her 80s. And uh, her name's Dolores, and her and I shared a kitchen together. And we became very good friends, and we would talk about life and love and happiness. And I came to really care about her. And one night, uh, I woke up, it was around three in the morning, I had a big window, and you know, through the blinds, I could see the lights from the ambulance that were outside. And I looked, and she was getting taken away on a stretcher. And she was still alive, but she was having major, major health complications. And uh, I went and I visited her in the hospital. And I sat with her for like an hour. And she had tubes in and out of her system. She had a very high fever. She was in pain. And I talked to the doctors, and I I guess I felt like this was her time, and I didn't want her to suffer anymore. So I told her that I loved her, and I said my goodbyes. But Dolores was not done fighting. And she ended up getting better. And after a few months, they were able to move her to a retirement community. And I went, and I visited her in the retirement community. And I was like, how are you doing? And she smiles and she goes, I'm doing really well. And I said, yeah? And she goes, yeah. And then she leans in and she goes, I met a guy. (laughs) And I was like, what do you mean you met a guy? She said, I met a guy at the retirement community and we've been dating. And I'm really falling for him. And I thought that was so beautiful because if you think your life is over, it's over no matter how long you're alive. But if you believe that any moment can bring you infinite possibilities, then a miracle could be right around the corner, even love. So I wrote this poem. I want to fall in love at 85. Go on shuffleboard dates and dance to hip hop from 95. Are you guys not big hip hop fans? I don't understand. (laughs) We would also listen to the song Staying Alive, but only for the message. 
Otherwise, we'd keep away from disco. It's depressing. We'd rock matching track suits and rope gold chains. We'd look like Run DMC, but in their old age. We'd take aerobics classes and wear bifocal glasses and eat at IHOP and hold hands at Sunday masses. And when it comes to the bedroom, well, nothing much would happen in the bedroom because we're 85. But we would still be down to take a walk or take a drive or sit and talk or have a drink, watch the passers-by, ask each other why and how and who and where and when, and then we'd laugh and cry again about all the people we had been. And I would touch her withered skin and comment on how thin it is to keep in something infinite. And she would smile sweet and blush, then tell me that I think too much. She's right, I think too much. It's always been a problem. But then again, that's how I made my green like the goblin. When I was in my 20s, I was eating top ramen, counting up my pennies, saving up to go food shopping. But now I'm 85, and somehow I feel more alive. I turned my hearing aid up and bumped the Jackson 5. I read the sports page while she peruses classifieds. We like antique stores, garage sales, and barter buys. And when it comes to the bedroom, well, hopefully, every once in a while, she lets me knock her boots into the floral patterns of our bedpost, then hold her head close like death isn't chasing us, planning on erasing us and replacing us with better versions of us, reshaping us, remaking us, then recreating us with new identities so we can make new memories. Hush, little baby. Learn to walk and talk and think and lie and feel and fight and love and die and never get the answers why. She dips a joint of grass and wheat grass and we get high. Her hair is silver as the moon in the Lisbon sky. We still pop pills, but it's not the Xanax anymore. Whenever we can't sleep, we listen to the ocean floor. She got a Sound of the Sea CD for me from the Brookstone store. And ever since, I've been snoring like a, like a, like a really good metaphor for snoring. Sorry, I go blank sometimes. What, I'm 85. I'm not complaining. I'm just happy that I'm still alive and happy that I have my better half by my side, super fly. She doesn't look a day over 75. When I first saw her, I was totally in awe. She was classical, so I was like, yo, yo, ma. And that was all it took. A single look and I was shook. I fell for her like some loose shingles from our Spanish roof. And I'm a lover till she loses every last root and has to glue dentures to her gums to chew solid food. Ooh, now that's real love, dude. That's some push comes to shove love. Not when it's convenient, love. Hospital bed, love. Feed her ice chips, love. Never leave the room, love. Sleeping in the chair, love. Pray to up above, love. Have to pull the plug, love. Miss her in my bones, love. Everything about her love, die within a month, love. Can't live without her love. Love, the reason that we are all alive. And none of us should have to wait until we're 85.
Thank you. All right, I just want to do one more quick thing. So everybody close your eyes. Just take a moment. Everybody close your eyes. And this is about dreams. Where we're at is about facilitating your dreams. So I want you to think about the biggest dream that you have in your life right now. The thing that you want more than anything else in the world. There's something very powerful about dreaming as a community, and it can be for yourself, or it can be for someone you love, or it could be for the planet. Your career, health. But just put your energy there for a moment. And now, I want you to think of a situation in which your dream is already a reality. In which everything that you want is right here and right now. And I want you to feel the feelings that you would feel. All of the love. All of the gratitude. and all of the joy. Okay, you can open up your eyes. Most people don't change. I mean, they won't change. I mean, they can change, but usually they don't. I find it so strange. People just continue to repeat the same pattern like the consequences of them doesn't matter. But is that true? What if God put a magnifying glass over you, over me, over everything we see, and this world is an experiment for your soul to survive separated from our infinite whole? We wouldn't know joy unless we knew pain. I'm looking for a new way to say the same old thing. They say the same old thing and then expect a different response. It's hard to explain. I guess your heart wants what it wants. I used to think there was a right and wrong. Now I know that I was wrong, so I write, darkness is a form of light. I used to think that I was mad at you. I was really mad at me, but in retrospect, that's how it had to be. I used to think I knew some shit. Now I know I don't know, shh, but at least I know enough, shh, to know I don't know, shh. I'm a hitchhiking ghost trying to find his way home. Every mistake that I make, I put inside of a poem. She wants to change her man, but she's focused on her man. She should focus on herself, rearrange her mental health. He wants to change his girl, but he's focused on his girl. He should focus on himself, rearrange his mental health. We want to change the world, but we're focused on the world. We should focus on ourselves. Why do I repeat myself? Everybody's superpower doubles as their kryptonite. I think too much to sleep at night, but that's what makes me rip the mic. So if eventually... Technology takes all of the jobs as we know it. All of us will just have more time to be musicians and be poets. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you guys.
Peço desculpa. <coughs>
Despite all of that technological progress, the fraction of adults working in the labor force in the United States and in most other developed countries has risen decade over decade. If we look in the US, it's risen in all but two of the last decades in the last 128 years. And part of the recent fall off that you see reflects the aging of the population. So this raises an interesting question, which is, why are there still so many jobs? Why hasn't machinery already made our labor redundant, our skills obsolete? So I'm gonna to try to give a brief answer to that question. I'm gonna talk about two economic forces that I think help to explain uh, what type of work we do and how much work there is to do, and also help to think about what we should worry about and what we should not worry about. Those two forces, one of them has to do with human ingenuity, creativity, expertise. I'm gonna call that the O-ring principle. The other has to do with human insatiability or greed, if you like. I'm gonna call that the never get enough principle. In combination, I think this will help understand why work continues to exist. And then I'm gonna go further and I'm gonna talk about what are the jobs of the future, what type of work we'll have to do. And I think uh, you'll, at least to me, it's surprising uh, how the different strands come together and pull apart. So let me start again with the O-ring. So when those automated teller machines were introduced, they did just what you would think they did. They replaced a lot of the cash handling jobs that were done by bank tellers. The number of tellers per branch fell by about 30% over the course of a few years. More machines, fewer workers. However, banks quickly discovered that when they could open a branch with just a few workers and a couple of machines, they could open more branches more cost effectively. And so they started branching like crazy. The number of bank branches increased by about 40%. So in net, the number of bank tellers rose. But it isn't that simple. They weren't all doing the same job they used to be. As their kind of uh, cash handling checkout functions became less important, what became more important was their problem solving skills, their expertise, their relationship with their customers, their ability to introduce them to new products, new accounts, new investments, uh, establish a relationship and solve a problem. So there were more tellers doing a more intellectually demanding, more interactive job. This example, although it's not representative, it's also not unique. Most jobs require a panoply, a range of tasks. They require perspiration and inspiration, expertise, judgment, and creativity. They require um, uh, both uh, sweat and inspiration. Um, what that means in economic terms is those tasks are complements. They all need to be done to accomplish the work. So what that means is as we automate a subset of those tasks, the value of the remaining work increases. Uh, as we automate a lot of the cash handling that bank tellers did, the value of their expertise, of their judgment, of their relationship with their customers rose. So let me give you an extremely stark example of this. In January of 1986, the space shuttle Challenger took off from Cape Canaveral in Florida. Within a minute and a half, uh, it had exploded and crashed back down to Earth. The investigation of that crash quickly turned up what the culprit was. It was a rubber O-ring in one of the booster rockets that had failed catastrophically because it had frozen on the launch pad the night before. And when the shuttle took off, hot gas escaped, it caused the rocket to catch fire, it exploded, and brought the space shuttle back down to Earth. Uh, a famous paper about this tragic circumstance by the Harvard economist Michael Kramer, called the O-ring principle, remarks that, the, that in this multi-billion dollar, multi-decade enterprise, the thing that made the difference between success and the lives lost of seven astronauts was a simple rubber O-ring. And he said, well, you could think a lot of a lot of work of having this property. Imagine that the jobs that you do are like a series of interlocking uh, uh, links in a chain. And uh, for the job to succeed, every link needs to hold. If any one of them fails, the whole thing comes crashing to the ground. 
Well, that's a precarious situation. It doesn't sound like a, the workplace you'd want to be in. However, it has a surprisingly positive implication, which is, let's say initially, all the links are, are kind of weak and brittle and unreliable. Well, what that means is, uh, if you, your link, the thing you do, isn't reliable, not a big deal. Probably something else is going to fail in any case. But as each of the other links are fortified, made reliable, made robust, or made sturdy, uh, the importance of you doing your job correctly increases. In the limit, the only thing that matters is that your link holds, because all the other ones are going to succeed. So in the Space Shuttle Challenger, the reason that little O-ring was so important is because everything else worked properly. If, it, if everything else had also been unreliable and badly engineered, it wouldn't have mattered. The shuttle would have crashed regardless. However, when it was all done right, every single piece became important. Similarly, when you think about the bank tellers, the reason that their problem-solving skills became more important, the reason their relationships to their customers became more important was because all of the regular routine task of handling money, that was automated. And so this remaining bit increased in importance. In most of the work that we do, we are the O-rings in the production process. Whether we are designing a building, teaching a class, diagnosing a patient, in all those cases, our expertise, our judgment, and our creativity become more important as the tools that we have improve, as the set of things we can accomplish in a given day increases, the value of doing that work well, of doing it right, becomes more important over time. So technology magnifies the importance of the work we do. It increases the value of our expertise, the knowledge we have about the subject, our judgment, meaning applying that knowledge to a specific domain, and our creativity, meaning thinking of a way to take that expert judgment and apply it to a new problem and come up with a better solution. So that's the O-ring principle, and it helps explain the type of work we do. But now you might be saying, okay, right, I get it. If people do work, it's going to be important. However, that doesn't tell us much about the, how much work there will be to do. And it seems kind of intuitive that if we get sufficiently good at something, we're kind of out of a job. So take, for example, farming. Uh, in the year 1900, 40% of all US employment was on farms, in agriculture. I'm sure in Portugal it was at least equally high. At present, it's under 2%. Um, now, that's an amazing accomplishment, right? It's now the case that a couple of million farmers can feed a population of more than 300 million citizens. It's a huge amount of productivity increase. But it's also pretty clear why are there so few farmers nowadays. It's not because we're eating less. It's because we become so productive that we need fewer of them. And farming is not, a, is not an unusual example. Many industries, many services, when you become sufficiently productive about, uh, at them, they eventually contract because uh, our productivity rises so much, there's just only so much work to do. Yet, what's true of a single sector or a single service has never been true of the economy as a whole. Many of the jobs in which we work nowadays, whether they are medicine, software and services, uh, finance, law, were tiny or didn't exist 100 years ago. Many of the things that we spend money on, uh, you know, sport utility vehicles, air conditioning, uh, mobile phones, uh, those things were incalculably costly or simply hadn't been created a century ago. So as our productivity increases and the set of activities that we can accomplish expands, we think of new services, new products, new activities that occupy our attention, that command our income, and that create work. Now, you may say, you know, some of these things are frivolous. You know, who needs extreme yoga? Who needs Bitmoji? Uh, who needs, you know, uh, celebrity tourism? Uh, who needs, you know, uh, economists talking in a beautiful park at night? Uh, seems frivolous. I agree. However, uh, people value these things. Uh, they value them, and they're willing to work hard to attain them. So the average worker in 1950, uh, sorry, in 2015 could have the average standard of living of a worker in 1915, 100 years earlier, by working about 18 weeks a year, about a third of the year. So you could just say, hey, I've worked 18 weeks. I have the 1915 standard of living. I'm done. People don't choose to do that. 
Why? Well, presumably because they want the experiences, the goods and services, the standard of living that is available to people who continue to work hard. So we have created a world of vast luxury, and yet our desire to experience those things has risen with our incomes, and that keeps us working. So the economist Thorsten Veblen once said, uh, invention is the mother of necessity. It, uh, as we create things, we create needs. And just as an example of that, um, people often assert, well, technology is eliminating jobs, we're running out of jobs. There's no evidence from across the industrialized world that we're anywhere close to running out of jobs at present. The US, for example, has added almost 20 million jobs since the depth of the Great Recession. But the US uh, is, is one among many countries that is growing rapidly and raising employment over time. Now, of course, there'll be recessions, there'll be setbacks, but the point I want to make is, in the last 10 years, there have been 30 million articles about the end of work and 20 million jobs created in the very same place those articles are being written. So it's a little puzzling. So now I want to be more specific. Why doesn't automation eliminate work? What are the jobs of the future? People are always asserting that those jobs will come. Let me try to give you some examples of what they are. And here I'm actually drawing the work that I've done with my co-author Anna Solomons of uh, Utrecht, uh, who's also uh, uh, here uh, 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 evaluating the quality of this talk. So I'm going to say there, I, mean, I think you can classify this into four different channels. I'm going to call these, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll name them as I go. Uh, and the last one will be new jobs. So first is what I'm going to call Uber effects. So this shows you the number of taxi trips in New York in 2015. This shows you the number of taxi trips in New York in 2018. It's fallen by 300,000, right? Do you think the number of rides given uh, to passengers has fallen or risen in this time? Right? All right. Hands up. Okay. Uh, risen. All right. So here you see it. Oh, uh, you might have. Uh, you don't see it. Okay. Uh, so if you were to add in Uber, which is here, and Lyft, which is there, that rises to 820,000. So, uh, so the, although the although taxi employment has fallen because of Uber, right? total ride hailing has risen enormously and the number of people involved in doing that has risen simultaneously. Why is that? Because the quality of the product has, an improve, has improved, the price has fallen, people buy a lot more of it. So Uber is more efficient, it's more productive than taxi driving. The end result is more people taking more rides, using more workers to get there. A second effect is what you might call the pingo doce effect. <laughs> which is uh, a fall in the cost of necessities, uh, freeze income for luxuries. In the United States, we call this the Walmart effect. Uh, and so uh, as the price of goods, and as productivity rises, our incomes effectively rise. People used to spend 30 or 40% of their incomes on food. Now typically they'll spend 10 to 15%. All that extra resources creates demand for new stuff, right? Gives people extra income to have bigger houses, better vacations, uh, uh, longer sales along the river here. The third effect, oh, that's the Walmart example. The third effect is what I'm going to call business to business effects. So let me give you a really concrete example. Here's the, uh, the uh, leader of the free world, Donald Trump, uh, remarking that tariffs are great. And why are tariffs great? Well, there are 400,000 US workers involved in uh, manufacturing metals. So you imagine if we raise tariffs on steel, on aluminum, that's going to increase employment in metal manufacturing in the United States. And that's almost surely true. If you have those tariffs high enough for long enough, the number of people working in U.S. steel and U.S. aluminum will rise. However, there are another more than 4 million workers working in things that use metal. Fabricated metal, machinery, motor vehicles, aerospace. Right? What do you think is going to happen to their employment as those tariffs rise? It's going to fall. Right? So you can think of productivity growth as being the opposite of tariffs. Right? So uh, over between 1980 and 2017, the number of person hours required to make a ton of steel fell from 10 to 1.5, an 85% reduction. It's like an 80% tariff decline in steel production. 
that's certainly going to reduce steel manufacturing employment, but it's going to cause overall employment in the economy to expand because autos are going to get cheaper, because machines are going to get cheaper, because uh, little metal toys are going to get cheaper, right? Many, many things, and that's going to create employment. Okay, and in fact, if you look, this actually draws on my recent paper with Anna Salomons. This shows you productivity growth in industries throughout the developed world. This shows you employment growth, and the industries that have had the most productivity growth have tended to shrink. So if we simply focused, for example, on steel, we'd say, oh, lots of productivity growth, shrinking employment. But we know in this period, employment has risen in aggregate. Why is that? Well, as we get better at making stuff, sure, we use fewer workers doing that than all the other industries that require those inputs and all the other firms that supply the raw materials to that industry, they all expand. Okay, so let me finally talk about new jobs. This is not just the same old work. What are the new jobs? Well, I'm going to divide those into three categories. What I'm calling frontier jobs, wealth work, and last mile jobs. Okay, what are frontier jobs? So here is a, here's a frontier job. This is a job that didn't exist 20 years ago, a search engine optimization analyst. What is that? Well, you're selling some product. It's going to be on Google. You want your product listing to be ranked high, so you hire someone who goes in and monkeys around with the keywords until they can beat the algorithm to get their listing high in the queue. Right? That's a search engine optimiza optimization analyst. There are many other such jobs, jobs that didn't exist and exist because they require expertise of the new technology. So robot integrators, those are the people who figure out how to put robots into your business. Cloud computing specialists, autonomous vehicle programmers, biomedical engineers, radiation therapists. And in every generation, when there's a new technology, there's a set of people who are the frontier workers. In one period, they would have been auto mechanics. They would have been railroad, they would have been train operators. Uh, they might have been people who uh, you know, knew how to use uh, telephones and telegraphs. They could have been the computer installers. Right? In the current era, there are people who are expert with uh, the newest generations of machines and the occupations that use those. So, uh, it's convenient to imagine that all of the work of the future is basically people programming computers and optimizing search engines. That's not correct. There will always be a set of that, um, but that's only a subset of the new type of work that's created. A second type of work created uh, is what I'm going to call wealth work. This is work that exists because people are made wealthier by productivity growth. So here are job postings for animal psychologists. Uh, those are people who analyze your pet. They'll take your fish, uh, sit down on the couch, have a conversation with it, and try to improve its mental health. Um, but here's a, here's a list of other wealth work jobs. These are actual jobs that have been added to the US listing of standard occupations. Body piercer, horse exerciser, indoor landscape gardener, pet crematory worker, and of course, the ever popular oyster preparer. So these are jobs, they aren't technologically new, right? They're new in the sense that because we become more affluent as our productivity grows, we start demanding new goods, new services, and we hire people to do things that it just would have been, inc been inconceivable to spend money on until we were sufficiently wealthy. Right? So that's a second category of work. So there's the frontier jobs, and then there's the wealth work. And now let me talk to the last category, which I think is an extremely important one. What I'm going to call last mile jobs. These are jobs that exist at the, in at the, at the intersection of technological capacity and regular day-to-day -day human work. These are people who are filling in for the machine where the machine can't quite complete the job. So one is the social media content tagger. So what is a content tagger? They're basically a person who looks on Facebook and says, that's pornography, that's not pornography. That's appropriate, that's inappropriate, right? They have the job of figuring out subtleties that a machine can't figure out. Let me give you another example from a, a book by Mary Gray, who's an anthropologist, uh, has a forthcoming book called Ghost Work. Uh, imagine you call an Uber, and uh, you're waiting, and Uber connects you to a driver, and the driver gets into his or her, his vehicle, and uh, Uber now has drivers scan their faces before they pick up a passenger to verify that it is the driver it's said to be. This is a safety feature. Well, imagine that this driver has recently shaved off his beard at the request of his girlfriend. 
uh, or boyfriend. And, uh, and so the software can't determine correctly whether it, that is the same person as in the old photograph. So what happens? Well, in the fraction of a second, those two images, the old image and the one that was recently scanned from the phone, are sent to a worker, perhaps in the United States, perhaps in the Philippines, perhaps in India, and that person sees those two images on the screen and makes a determination about whether that's the right, the same person. If they say yes, that driver will pick you up. If they say no, that ride will be canceled and you'll be sent a new driver, right? That is a last mile job, right? doing the last bit of the task that the machine can't do. So let me give you some other examples. So image tankers, tag taggers, adult content filters, photo verification agents, those are the guys from the Uber, image matchers, uh, people who identify hate speech on websites. There are many such jobs, and there have always been such jobs, things that uh, as we automate, there's a, a, a trailing edge of things left for people to do that the machine can't do. Eventually, it becomes automated. So for example, uh, 40 years ago, the US Postal Sar Service started using optical character recognition to read addresses on envelopes. But it could only read the ones that were typed. Things that were hand addressed would be kicked out and sent to a person. They'd be scanned, the machine would reject it, it would send it to a human worker. That was a last mile job. Now that last mile has been paved, so to speak. It's now all done by machine. Um, but this is part of the process. So let me give you some current examples that help to see how important this is and why this is a hard problem. So this is the Amazon Kiva order fulfillment system. So what you see, that little orange thing that looks like a vacuum cleaner, that's a robot. What it does is when new products come into an Amazon warehouse, they come off the truck, those little guys, those little robots, um, drive up shelves up to the loading dock People take things off the truck, they put them onto the shelves, and they tell the computer what's on the shelf. The robots then drive the shelves into the warehouse uh, and organize the warehouse. No person is involved in deciding what goes where. The robots pack them in very densely, and they notice. They say, look, you know, if every night people get on Amazon and they order you know, a paperback book, a crate of diapers, and a six-pack of beer, well, the books, the diapers, and the beer will all be kept together on these shelves. Then when someone orders, what happens? The robots uh, go drive under the shelves, they pick them up, and they bring them to the human pick worker. The human pick worker uh, stands there, a laser pointer on the ceiling points the objects on the shelf, the pick worker picks it up, scans it, confirms it's the correct option, uh, object, sticks it in a box, puts on some tape and a packing label, and off it goes. Right? This is a last mile job. Okay? There are now hundreds of thousands of people in the United States who do this for a living. In another era, they might have been cashiers, right? They might have been warehouse workers. Now they're the people who complete that last bit of the task, which is the dexterous handling of uh, irregular objects, correctly recognizing what they are, scanning them for imperfections. So if you pick up a book and it, you know, it's, it's water damaged or uh, pages are torn out, you wouldn't put it in the box. That's part of the job. Right? This is... Uh, a relatively low paid, relatively uninteresting job. However, there, are me much, there is much work like this where people will fill in. Eventually these will go away, but in the interim, they're a very important part of the job. And of course, for each new set of technologies, new last mile jobs will be created. So we will continue to see them, not the same ones. I predict that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, there will be no Amazon pick workers, but there will be something analogous to that. Let me tell you, give you one more example of why this type of, why these, these subtleties, these last miles are so difficult. So this is a picture from a well-known paper in computer science, now almost 20 years old, called What is a Chair? So imagine you were uh, writing a piece of software, give, writing a computer, and you wanted to tell a computer how to pick out chairs in a photograph. So you could, your first attempt, you say, okay, look for things that have four legs and a base and a back. And then you set the software to work and it picks out a lot of things that looks like chairs, but it leaves out all the stools, right? And it leaves out all the, uh, the one-legged chairs and all the rolling chairs. And so it's good, everything it picks is accurate, but uh, lots of things that are chairs are left out. Then you say, oh, I didn't write the software right. 
let's just say it just has to be lifted off the ground, it has to have a base, uh, and that's good enough. And then sure enough, it would get all the chairs, but then it would also get the tables, right, and the couches, and the dishwashers, right? So that wouldn't work either. And so uh, simply describing the characteristics of an object that make it a chair aren't gonna work. How do people solve this problem? Well, one argument in computer science is that people reason not just from the characteristics of the objects, but what they're for. So you could think to yourself, would I want to sit on that? And you could look at the first one, you say, yep, that looks fine, could sit there. And then you look at the next one, you say, well, it's not a standard chair, but sure, I'll sit on that. And then you look at the third one and you think, no, I'm not sitting there, right? Why? Because it's not that it's not chair-like, it's that you understand how it will be used, right? Uh, and this is an important part of solving any such problem. You can show a child a picture of a couple of bicycles, and then they could recognize immediately uh, the bicycles, the unicycles, the tricycles, the bicycles that are wrapped around trees, that are bent and broken. They can recognize the whole category. People can re use small data, right? They can reason from a very small number of examples to come up with the general principle why? Because they have an understanding of how these pieces interact and what they're for. It's really the opposite of what people, what machines do with big data, which is they have a limited understanding and they need many, many, many such examples. So this example of reasoning about a chair points out how subtle and difficult a problem this actually is. So the, uh, the astronomer Carl, Carl Sagan once said, uh, if you want to bake an apple pie from scratch, you need to first invent the universe. And this problem has the feeling of needing to first invent the universe. So that's why these last mile jobs, like social media content tagger and image matchers and that person who verifies the Uber image, those specific jobs won't be here forever, but we will always be creating new jobs like that. Okay, so those are the types of new work we should expect to see. So now let me ask, so I've told you a kind of story about automation and employment. And uh, I've said there will be jobs, there we're not gonna run out of work. So does that mean there's nothing to worry about? This is a problem that everyone's concerned about, but eventually we'll all just get used to it. And that is not the argument I'm making. The argument that I'm making is that these technological changes, they raise productivity and that creates possibility. It allows us to do more with less. And so that creates an opportunity for growing prosperity, growing employment, many other things. But there's no guarantee that we will use that opportunity well. That doesn't just depend on the technology. It doesn't just depend on the market. It also depends on our social institutions, the choices that we collectively make. Take the example of Norway and Saudi Arabia. These are two oil-rich countries, they basically have money coming out of a hole in the ground. These are not equally well-off places. Norway is typically ranked between first and third in uh, satisfaction of its citizenry. Uh, it has, uh, it's a country where people work and play well together. Labor force participation rates in Norway are higher than almost any other country. Uh, and uh, it's a country that has uh, good education and lots of opportunity and a relatively satisfied citizenry. Saudi Arabia is also a wealthy nation, uh, and, it, and because of its wealth, it has dramatically, over time, raised the material living standards of its citizens. However, it's typically ranked about 32nd, uh, or in the 30s, in terms of measures of national satisfaction, and the reasons are clear. It's not because of technology, uh, they both have a lot of oil to make them wealthier, but of course, Saudi Arabia has raised material living standards while frustrating many other th of the other strivings of its citizens. Uh, people have, do not have a path to self-determination, to freedom, to creative expression, because there are so many constraints on their liberty in this absolute monarchy. And so the difference between these two countries is not their access to wealth or the technology they use to create it, but whether they've used that wealth to create opportunity, mobility, uh, and a sense of agency in the citizens, or to frustrate many of those strivings. So two countries, both well off, both wealthy, not equally well off. 
the analogy to technological change is technological change, these advances that we're discussing, are like the discovery of oil, right? They raise our wealth. There's no question that robotics, artificial intelligence, those will raise GDP. They will make nations wealthier. But whether they make citizens well off depends not just on the machines, but how we use those machines to advance shared goals. Um, let me just skip that one, skip that one as well. Okay, so let me um, go back to the example of farming. So, oh, sorry, let me go here instead. <laughs> so, um, the challenge that, uh, that we face uh, in many industrialized economies, uh, Portugal being one of them, is that uh, we have lots of employment growth, jobs are growing, but those jo job growth looks increasingly like a barbell with growing poundage on either side of the bar, right? So on the right side of this bar, what are these jobs? Many of these are technical, managerial, and profession, professional jobs. Those are the frontier jobs. Those are the jobs that become more valuable as technology advances. On the other hand, many of these jobs at the bottom also growing, you know, personal services, uh, food service, cleaning, um, uh, security, home health aides, many of these are either last mile jobs or wealth work jobs. They're jobs that uh, don't require high levels of human skill and expertise, but are extremely hard to, they're extremely hard to automate. In the middle, what is contracting rapidly are blue collar production and operative positions, and similarly, a white collar clerical and administrative support positions. It's not hard to see why those middle positions are declining, right? Many of them are, carry out routine activities that are increasingly feasible to codify in software and have machines execute. But this is a problem. Why is it a problem? Because this knocks out rungs in the career ladder, uh, makes it harder for people to advance from poverty into wealth, and potentially contracts the size of the middle class. So this polarized phenomenon, this polarized employment, is, uh, is an understandable consequence of technology, but it's not a favorable one. We don't want to live in a world where uh, there's a large elite uh, doing high-paid, engaging, stable jobs, and then a large stratum of uh, remaining people whose primary job it is to see to the comfort and health and, uh, and, and, and care of the wealthy. That is an important problem. And we can see this as well in the polarization of earnings. This shows, shows you data from the United States showing the growth of earnings by education. So these are high school dropouts, high school grad, some college, college grad, and people with a post-college education. This is men, this is women. And this incredible fanning out reflects this phenomenon of very, very high returns at the top for people who are doing that frontier work and very low wages for people who are doing that last mile work and that wealth work. That is a challenge. However, let me give you some positive news. So uh, I mentioned the, contract the contraction of agriculture. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, people working on farms looked around and they saw that the technology was advancing, employment in agriculture was contracting, and their kids uh, might not be needed on the farm. And that was a challenge because they faced the prospect of a generation that was not prepared for industry and no longer needed in agriculture. And so what did they do? They did something really radical. They passed laws saying that their kids needed to remain in school until age 16. That was radically expensive. Why was it expensive? Not only because you had to build schools, hire teachers, and buy books, but because those kids couldn't work in the family business of farming while they were in school. There was a huge opportunity cost to requiring those children to be in school. That movement, which was called the high school movement, uh, at the time was considered a kind of a risky investment, almost frivolous. Why does everyone need to be you know, literate and numerate? It seems extreme. That's an elite skill set. Arguably, that was the best public investment the United States made in the 20th century. It gave us the most skilled, the most flexible, the most productive workforce in the world. When World War II occurred, part of the reason the United States was able to so rapidly expand its military was because it had a skilled workforce that could be quickly pressed into, uh, into the industrial sector. 
to think about how well that worked, imagine taking the labor force of the turn of the 20th century, people in 1899, 1901, and plunking them down in contemporary uh, industrialized economy. Many of them would have strong backs and good characters, but they would lack the literacy, the numeracy skills to do all but the most basic jobs. So that investment in education is what allowed the United States and many other countries to take advantage of the technology we were creating to adapt to the world of work. And so the technology, the technological chain created opportunity, but the public decision to invest in its citizenry allowed countries to take advantage of that opportunity. Okay, so uh, in the interest of time, I'm actually gonna skip another section and just come to a conclusion, the long history of the future. So, um, uh, people have repeatedly asked over the last two centuries, uh, isn't it the case um, that our technologies are going to make us obsolete, to make our skills irrelevant, to make our expertise superfluous? Um, why has that not occurred so far? Well, I think there's, a, a, there's two fundamental forces that help to answer that question. One is, of course, what I call the O-ring principle, the way that technological change complements us, the way it makes our expertise, our judgment, and our creativity more valuable. And the other is what I call the never get enough principle, which is simply that we're insatiable. As we get wealthier, we invent new stuff. We want that stuff. It keeps us working. Um, now, you may say uh, that, you know, this is kind of an interesting story about the distant past and the recent past and maybe the present, but probably not about the future because this time is different, right? Uh, is this time different? And of course the answer is yes, this time is different, but every previous time has also been different. They've all been different and created challenges in their own way. So if you look at the history of this, you will find uh, many examples of people uh, being uh, deeply concerned about the possibility of uh, whether work will still exist in the future. So you can turn to the Luddites uh, in the uh, 1800s rising up against the power loom, but you don't have to look that far back in time. U.S. Secretary of Labor James Davis in 1927 uh, was worried about the scrapping of men, just like the scrapping of machines. Nobel laureate Vasily Leontief in 1982 said that humans are like horses, they will soon be put out to pasture. And of course, if you look at the... Uh, my, uh, the uh, house organ of MIT, the MIT Technology Review, you can see machine, people first using machines, then the melding, and pretty much after a while, the machines are kicking the people out of work. Um, I find <clears throat> these predictions, uh, uh, what's the right word? <laughs> I, indescribable. Uh, <laughs> I, I find these predictions presumptuous. Uh, they presume that uh, people will not think of new things to do. If they can't imagine, if you can't imagine, if, if people who are writing these newspaper articles can't imagine what work will be in the future, then they're presuming that none of the rest of you will imagine it either, and your kids won't think of it either. And I don't think that that's a good bet to make. I couldn't tell you what people will do for a living 100 years from now. But... The future doesn't depend upon my imagination. I don't need to think of it for someone else to do it. So imagine a case. I like to imagine the case. Imagine I was a farmer in Iowa in 1940, and 40% of employment in my state was in agriculture, and then some twerpy economist from MIT transported back in time and said, hey, guess what, Farmer Otter? I have some great news for you. Uh, over the next 100 years, the fraction of people working in agriculture it's gonna fall from 40% to 2% um, purely because of rising productivity. What do you think the other 38% of people will do? Well, I would not have said, oh, we got this, you know, radiological medicine, search engine optimization, Bitmoji, we'll keep ourselves busy, right? I would not have been able to think about, to think of what the work of the future would have been. However, I hope I would have had the wisdom to say, Wow, that's a 95% reduction in work needed to do agriculture with no starvation. That's a tremendous opportunity. I hope that people figure out something really good to do 
with that opportunity. By and large, I would say collectively that people have. They have used those possibilities well. And so that at least makes me optimistic that as we enter this next really exciting era of technologies that will do things that were more human-like than any previous wave of technology has done, that that will create possibility, prosperity, and that we will use that to make our citizenry, to make our society more interesting, more fulfilling, more secure, and ultimately healthier and more rewarding. So when we say what is the work of the future, I don't know for sure, but I, I'm pretty confident of two things. One is there will be a lot of work in the future. It will be in a couple, several categories. It will be frontier, frontier jobs, it will be wealth work, it will be last mile jobs, but there will be work. And the second thing I would say is that the future is not predetermined. It isn't known to us because, it, because we decide it. And so a lot of the work of the present is choosing what the future will be. In other words, taking the set of opportunities for which that we are creating and turning them into the set of things we desire. And certainly when we look over the last century, that's what many of the countries in which we live have done. They've taken an era of unprecedented technological progress and used that to create societies that are democratic, that are egalitarian, that are relatively free from hunger, that have low levels of violence, and they are creative and rewarding and are worth living in. And there's no reason that this era of technological progress can't also lead in that very same direction. There's no guarantee that it will, but it's open to us to make that happen. So the work of the present is to make the future what we would like to be based on the opportunities that we are creating. Thank you very, very much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to this talk. And uh, if I can find the cube, I'm happy to throw it out to the audience. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, if there, I'd be happy to, I can just, <laughs> yes, okay, to this gentleman back there. Here we go. Oh, sorry. Oh, good. With assist. Okay. Hello, David. Uh, thank you so much for your sp speech, and uh, I liked it very much. And I related uh, to the last part mostly because of the, the presencing that you spoke about and a little bit louder, are, please. Oh, sorry. And the construct, so about the, pres the presencing, the present, and the construction of the future. Uh huh. Uh, I'd like to know if you have an opinion about uh, MIT's Otto Scharmer theory U and this relation to the presencing and the construction of the, uh, of the analysis of the future with the technology and the work. Yeah, sorry, can you say, so MIT's relation to? Otto Scharmer. Professor Otto Scheimer, probably, okay. <laughs> Otto Scheimer, I know, well, Professor Otter, I know. Uh, Professor Scheimer, so I'm not Sh sure. Scheimer, yes, the German, a German professor. Uh, I apologize that I'm okay. not aware. I'm sure sorry. this is so, something I'm important sorry. that I don't so know I'll about. So I skipped my question. Uh, so, so, uh, I'll, but, let me, uh, but let me just sort of give a bigger answer. So MIT, um, you know, the president of MIT, Rafael Rafe, who's a really a Venezuelan, uh, feels very, uh, that MIT has a huge responsibility in this, and that MIT is creating a lot of te the technologies and it wants to be thinking hard about how they can be well used, what are the right policies, how do we adapt, how do we seize the opportunity. So uh, President Reif has commissioned a task force on the work of the future. I'm one of the, uh, the co-heads of that. And our goal is to say, what are the institutions we need? What are the possibilities we're gonna experience and how do we seize the opportunity. So ultimately, I think we have an optimistic vision of what's possible, mm -hmm. but also a real sense, and this is something that was mentioned in the panel earlier today, that these changes create challenges, right? It's not a win-win for everybody. The fact that it raises GDP doesn't mean every single person is better off, and without appropriate policies, there will be people who are left behind. So we say, oh, people went from farming into industry. Well, those weren't the same people. Right? Those weren't the farmers who were working at the Ford Motor Plant. Right? It's a generational process, and that transition is costly, and it's something that we have a shared responsibility to address, in my opinion. All right, why don't you Thank throw you. it to the next person? Hands up. Down, over there. Yeah, you can do better than me. Whoa. 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, I need your opinion about yeah. um, what will be uh, the, the government's uh, issues to fight the job, uh, the, that job uh, weight Polarization. Lift. Yes, the, the polarization that uh, we'll have in the future. Yeah, so I, I think that the challenge is one of preserving mobility, right? To making sure that people, that, that each generation is born with the opportunity to, on the basis of its hard work and its investment and its talent, to be successful. And what we don't want is a, is a society where if you don't choose the right parents, right, if you're not lucky enough to be born to an affluent family, then you won't have a shot of success, right? A lot of the America looks like this, by the way. We are a great meritocracy from the kind of median on up, right? And, from the, and below the median, there's a huge amount of entrenched disadvantage that makes it hard for talented kids from low-income families to have opportunity. So I think a lot of the role of of a government in a, uh, a technologically advanced society is to make investments on the one hand into people's skills to allow them to thrive, but also to provide social insurance to prevent people uh, realizing the gains from technology, just like realizing the gains from international trade, realizing the gains from immigration. Those create aggregate wealth, they create disruption, and we should be, if we're going to capture that benefit, we should be willing to also help address the cost on the individual level. So I think the government has really two major roles. One is investment in the citizens, and the other is uh, some degree of social insurance so that we preserve opportunity uh, and, uh, and limit hardship. I hope you. that helps a bit. All right, hands up. All right. Hello. I would like to ask... Um, what do you think about the countries that are ahead in this transition? How can then he they help countries that are still 10 years behind in this yeah. transition? How can they make this transfers, transference of knowledge so, so that the countries that are 10 years behind can um, be, uh, have a smoother transition? Sure. So. I think, so first of all, it's hard, you know, so I think we first said, are there countries that are more ahead than others? And I think, you know, it's easy to say, take the example of Scandinavia, right? Where everyone always invokes Scandinavia, these sort of paradises on earth, um, uh, where everything works right, or at least that's how we imagine it. Uh, and they do, they, they are good at dealing with shared prosperity. I mean, they're good at, at, at sharing prosperity, but there are lots of other examples of countries that are good at investing in their citizens. So we could look at, Germany, we could look at Austria, we could look at Switzerland, uh, we could look at the advances made in India, even many advances made in China, of countries that have been smart about taking public wealth and turning it into skills that allow people to be successful. Um, how one country helps another, that's hard. Uh, we're not, I, my observation is that countries are largely on their own <laughs> uh, in, uh, in doing these things, however they can learn from the examples of others in terms of saying we're going to uh, we're going to we're going to improve our public schools we're going to make we're going to guarantee nutrition we're going to make sure people have access to health care something that someday we hope to achieve in the United States uh, so I think there's there are good examples around us again because these are institutional choices countries are going to choose differently I think that's reasonable um, but there are a set of some things that work better than others, and we can learn from those other models. I hope that's sufficiently precise to be useful. I think I'm low. I think I'm. Uh, I think time's up. So that means I can take one more question. Uh, yes, the gentleman in the back, I guess. Thank you. So you you mentioned the investment from the government, yep. but essentially on the side of people. Yep. So one of the economists that I've, I've been reading to and listening to, uh, Mariana Mazzucato, she's been uh, increasingly talking about the importance of governments investing directly or uh, helping to create or to develop the ecosystems for new technologies. For example, GP GPS has been mm -hmm. heavily financed by governments. That's true. Um, uh, Elon Musk's companies have taken, I, I think, like $5 billion or something from the government. So uh, what's your view on how governments can shape directly the, um, the way that the industries have been developing and how technology is going to change our future? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a, a very astute question. People like to assume that all technology comes out of the private sector, right? It's all Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg or whomever. Uh, and that's really inaccurate. Uh, a lot of the important technologies that we, that those folks are building on actually came out of the military and out of public investment. Either they came directly out of military applications or they might have come from the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Health. And governments play a very big role in facilitating that investment, often because it's basic research. It doesn't have a commercial payoff in any time frame in which people would uh, be willing to invest in it. And I think it's really, it's valuable to understand that. And I do think uh, we have a role in that. So the, you know, the, the counterpoint, which many people say, uh, you hear often, oh, we ought we to tax the robots, right? Instead of investing in them, we ought to like, make them more expensive. And I can say without a lot of you know, deep analysis that that's a terrible idea. That's a really bad idea. Uh, why is that a bad idea? Well, you can make robots more expensive for yourself if you want to, but the rest of the world isn't going to do the same. And if you're not making things with robots in your country, you're going to be buying them from another country that's used, making them with robots that isn't taxing them. Right? We don't want to take innovative technologies and make them more expensive for ourselves. It's fine to tax capital if you think you should be taxing capital, but singling out the big advances and saying, let's make those relatively more expensive, that's not a good idea. But I will say that countries that make big investments often, in the long run, develop expertise or they face specific problems. So one of the countries that's the great exporter of windmills is the Netherlands, right? Why? Because they've been, you know, they have a lot of wind to work with. Uh, you know, countries that are aging more rapidly, that are, in other words, where demographics is moving faster, they're adapting robots more quickly because they substitute for uh, young, dexterous, dexterous workers. The country of Japan, because it's one of the most rapidly aging, is a leader in pharmaceuticals uh, for dealing with, uh, with um, geriatric disorders, disorders of elderly people. So it is the case uh, that often those challenges are opportunities if we make investments in them. Global warming, for example, creates all kinds of market opportunities for technologies that use less carbon and still produce energy. Countries that seize that opportunity will realize returns ultimately. So I think recognizing the role of the public in helping us to take advantage of those opportunities is really important. Uh, it's a very constructive thought. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you very, very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to participate. Thank you to the conference organizers. This is a spectacular event. I've never seen anything like this in the United States. I hope to import it back to my country. So thank you very much.